Um, welcome to Recharge the Chain, exploring prospects in the supply, in the electric assisted vehicle cycle and supply chain. Uh, my name is Dan Langford. I'm a principal consultant with Urban Foresight. We are UK's le leading place-based innovation consultancy. And this morning, we're proud to be working with Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland on this project, which this webinar is a crucial part. Uh, thanks for taking the time this morning to come and learn about Recharge the Chain, the project. Uh, I think it'll be worth your while and hopefully you gain some value from the session today, uh, learning about what we're up to and how we hope to progress this, the, the supply chain forward uh, in the sector. So moving on to the agenda for today. Get the next slide. The introduction, that's where we are. Um, in a few moments, we'll have a couple of guest speakers from Transport Scotland and Scottish Enterprise talking about the background and context of this particular project. Uh, we'll then get into a bit more details about what the, the project itself involves and what our aims and goals are and hopefully how we're going to go about achieving those things. And most importantly, uh, the industry's role uh, in contributing to this. Well, then we'll have a guest speaker from one of our uh, companies in the sector talking about their progress from a, a startup through to, well, something else <laughs> through to the current point that they are in, in developing their business uh, in the sector. And we'll also talk about some of the research that's been done today. Uh, hopefully we'll have some highlights for you, give you a little insight into the opportunities up and coming, uh, maybe some of the strengths and weaknesses of the sector. And at the end there, we'll have should have actually plenty of time for a Q&A if you've got any queries uh, to ask of the speakers. So getting on to moving on to a little bit of housekeeping. All attendees are muted, but you should be able to introduce yourself in the chat window. It looks like that is now enabled. Make sure when you do introduce yourself that you're actually speaking to everyone um, and not just selecting the panelists because we already know who you are, I guess. Um, so we want to make sure that you're, you're speaking to everyone that's on the call. If you've got any specific questions that you want to ask of any of our presenters, please put it in the Q&A window, uh, which is a separate window to the chat. Uh, if you put it in the chat, um, hopefully we'll spot it and find it, but it's more likely to get addressed if it's in the Q&A window. The event is recorded. Uh, this you know, We'll talk about this later, but it is a series of three events, so we do want people who unfortunately missed this one to be able to come back and look at it at, uh, at a future date. So why are we here? Recharge the Chain, the name of the project. It's a research project aimed to aimed at evidencing the local supply chain, its capabilities and appetite for growth. We're also exploring how the supply chain complements European market demand. Eventually, the intersection of the supply and demand allows us to identify opportunities within the sector for everyone involved. Well, as many people involved as possible. This is the first event in a series of three events over the next six weeks. We'll be sharing with you our progress and market insights and providing ample opportunity for you to get involved and contribute. But we'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about that later. But first up, we have a couple of speakers. Our first speaker will be Charlotte, who I believe has made it today, which is fantastic. Um, it's going to provide some background behind the project and the motivation and interest from Transport Scotland's perspective. Charlotte will be followed up by Moira, Moira Forsyth, who will explain the context of previous work that's been undertaken over the last couple of years by Scottish Enterprise and others within the industry. So right now, I believe I'm going to hand over to Charlotte Taylor, uh, Team Leader of Low Carbon Economy at Transport Scotland. Charlotte. Hi, every Hi everyone. I hope that you can hear me okay. Dan was cutting in. Hi, can you hear me okay? Dan was cutting in and out a bit there for me. Maybe uh, if Dan I, can give me a thumbs up, you can hear I can me. hear you fine. Okay, fabulous. Okay, well, I won't keep you all too long. Um, I'm hoping that uh, there's some slides teed up that someone's going to kindly uh, go through for me. Uh, but basically, what I wanted to do was to come and just give you a bit of background um, about why it is Transport Scotland is um, helping uh, get this project going and what our interest in the sector is. 
Um, so if you could go on to the first slide, Lorraine, that'd be great. great. So just to give you the context about what it is we're trying to do in our bit of Transport Scotland, um, those of you who know Transport Scotland will know that we do many things from um, roads to keeping uh, the rail uh, network going. Um, but the bit of Transport Scotland uh, that I sit in is uh, the Low Carbon Economy Directorate. And what we're interested in, we have this kind of three pronged uh, mission, which is about making sure that the transition to um, a decarbonised transport system uh, is greener, wealthier and fairer for Scotland. Um, so we're interested in the economic opportunities around the transition and where we um, need to and can and there's a case for us um, doing uh, doing additional things to help accelerate that. Um, Lorraine if you go to the next slide that would be great thanks. We know that there's um, you know a big challenge in decarbonizing the sector. Transport is now the largest emitting sector in Scotland um, and to achieve that decarbonisation, as well as uh, uh, getting zero emission vehicles on the road, we've got a, um, a modal shifts that uh, are also going to be needed. And part of that will be moving journeys from cars and vans um, and even trucks to uh, those with uh, bikes, e-bikes and e-cargo bikes. So we think that there's an opportunity there um, and we know that we have uh, some great innovation already going on in Scotland um, and we want to understand what the challenges are, what the potential market is and whether there's a, um, a need and a case for us to um, invest to help accelerate that um yeah so if you go to the next slide please thanks so i just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor of um work that we've done in other sectors so we have done some work with uh scottish enterprise and other partners in the heavy duty vehicle space um and what we did was we um did initial analysis to understand what capability we had in Scotland. We identified that there um, was capability in these niche heavy duty vehicles. There's uh, a demand for these vehicles, either because the technology is not quite there or there are other issues with kind of access to that. Um, we also have a good demand um, in Scotland and a public sector fleet that needs these vehicles. So opportunities to use public procurement to help um, move some of that innovation forward. Um, and what we've done is to help um, kind of bolster innovation in that sector by uh, bringing together um, networks um, and also by putting in place things like um, test centres. Um, we have funded some um, uh, work on academic networks. We know that we have strengths in the academic sector and um, gaps in terms of being able to bring that to um, industry. Um, and we've also established a fund which is around uh, innovation in manufacturing, um, a £28 million fund over four years to help support um, the challenges around getting uh, manufacturing um, to a kind of commercial um, a commercial stage with some of these uh, these vehicles and I should say that that's across um, transport modes and um, so if anyone's interested in that uh, worth speaking to the team about too. So um, Lorraine if you go to the next slide um, I also wanted to talk about the kind of collaborative focus of the work that we've been doing around uh, heavy duty vehicles. And um, that's, uh, we, we set up a, an industry advisory group and out of that came a group that also looked at bus decarbonization and brought together players from across that sector. Um, and uh, they've, uh, I've put the link on the slides. Um, but there's been some really kind of practical outcomes from that, both about uh, working with um, the likes of the uh, DNOs in terms of energy infrastructure and about things like uh, financing. Um, and that's a model that we've also taken into looking at the opportunity around heavy goods vehicles too. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, Lorraine, please. So 
so coming back to you'll be starting to wonder if I'm actually going to uh, mention bikes and e-bikes again um, but coming back to the kind of case in point um, what we want to do with this project and the reason that we're interested in this project was that we became aware of the market opportunity as part of the work we were doing on the heavy duty vehicle project um, and the good work that um, Moira and colleagues at Scottish Enterprise have been doing and Moira will be uh, talking a bit about that next um, and so what we want to do now is to speak to you we want you to uh, to talk to us let us know what are the challenges and also the opportunities around this area um, so that we can understand you know as I've said if there is a need for us to um, help to overcome some of those challenges and a case for that to be made so that's um, Lorraine if you go to the next slide that's why we really need your input so we want you to talk to us um, it's not about uh, yeah us kind of uh, sitting and thinking up um, great ideas um, we need to hear from you we need to understand the challenges um, uh, from your experience so hopefully that's given you a quick whistle stop tour of why we're interested and um, yeah the kind of point that we want to get out of this project. Um, I think I'm handing over next to Moira um, who's going to tell you a bit more uh, about the work that I mentioned um, that kind of brought this opportunity to our attention. Thanks very much. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I think the, the videos will swap over, so hopefully you can see me and you can hear me OK. Um, so thanks for that introduction, Charlotte. Um, and uh, thanks to Dan and the team for pulling this series of webinars together so, so very, very quickly. Um, as Dan and Charlotte have said, I'm Moira Forsyth. Um, I sit within the Innovation Systems team within Scottish Enterprise. Um, I know many people on this call already. <clears throat> and as Charlotte's given a, a really good background as to why we, Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland, are interested in the, the bike supply chain and the electric pedal assist vehicle market. Um, this is not something that Scotland is new at. If you could maybe move on to the next slide, Lorraine. Um, we're already very good at innovating around the bike. Um, and I have had the honour and privilege to be part of the team that has delivered the Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland project since 2014. Um, this was a project that was set up by ourselves at Scottish Enterprise in partnership with Scottish Cycling, Developing Mountain Biking in Scotland and Edinburgh Napier University um, sports sciences and engineering teams. And since 2014, we have been working with entrepreneurs, with startup companies and uh, with diversification businesses, with anybody who has an idea for an innovative product or service. Primarily in the early days, it was all around mountain biking because that's a big USP for Scotland. But as the project started to grow in breadth and depth, we now engage with companies across all cycling disciplines and across all kind of subsectors within cycling. So we work with digital and tech companies, we work with food and drink companies, we work with textiles companies, and we also work with manufacturing companies, examples of some of which are, are on the screen just now. And we were very good at that. Um, we have been working with a number of hundreds of businesses across the years. And what that then did was enable us to build a business case for further investment into this sector. Um, next slide, please, Lorraine. So a um, couple of years ago, um, it was announced that um, as part of one of the first rural city deal programmes, so the Borderlands Growth Deal, I'm sure you're all familiar with city deals, but this is the first rural deal. Um, which is across the for all local authority areas across the south of Scotland and north of England. And the team at the Mountain Bike Centre of Scotland, along with um, our colleague Ed Shoot from um, Scottish Cycling, we put in a bid to develop a, an innovation centre and an adventure bike park as part of the Borderlands Growth Deal. And we were successful. <clears throat> so we've been awarded £19 million for both those projects. And this is an artist's impression of what the new Cycling Innovation Centre is going to look like uh, when it comes on stream in 2024. It's now been delivered by my colleagues down at South of Scotland Enterprise. But this Cycling Innovation Centre is one of what we think is only three in the, the whole of Europe. And so it presents a bit of a step change and a gear up, pardon the pun, for the Scottish cycling industry. It's going to provide an ergonomics lab. We'll have a trail lab, so there'll be instrumented trails. 
There'll be a maker's lab, so there'll be an opportunity to use equipment, modern day equipment to prototype, as well as event space, business space, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really going to step up a gear, the, the position that Scotland has in, in this sector. Um, next slide, please, Lorraine. <clears throat> okay. Um, and why, why is this investment successful and why, why is it really important? Well, I'm, I, I could show you lots of stats about what's happened in the bike industry. I'm sure you, many of you on the call are aware. Um, but this is just one of them. <clears throat> COVID has, has um, uh, among other factors, economic factors, has really radically, dramatically changed the cycling industry. Um, from, from the point of view of participation, we've seen the demand for bikes has just gone through the roof and cycling you know, paraphernalia has gone through the roof, partly because people wanted to get, in, get onto bikes to get off of public transport during COVID partly because there suddenly became a demand in um, you know, bikes for, you know, um, for leisure activity. Um, sorry, Lorraine, if you could move on the slide again, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, but also because um, there was a great demand for cycling infrastructure. So we've seen a huge amount of investment going into, into this industry. But what COVID also did was radically dis disrupt supply chains. So where companies had um, traditional supply chains in the Far East, Suddenly, um, we have seen the ability to, to, to source materials, to ship materials, um, and to generally kind of, you know, um, fund, you know, the, the, the supply chains has kind of completely been disrupted. Um, and what that has meant is that most bike brands in Europe um, are looking to de-risk their supply chain. They're also looking at their sustainability criteria. It doesn't make sense if you're as marketing yourself as a zero emissions mobility form of transport to then be shipping small pieces of metal halfway around the world. So the way that we're looking at the bike industry and bike supply chains has radically changed. And we did use language in the early days of this disruption to talk about reshoring, but what we're now talking about is about developing local supply chains. And that's where I think a lot of the activity that we've already done in Scotland and what we're doing through this piece of work looking towards the future is gonna place us you know, to, to take advantage of any kind of growth here. Um, next slide, please, Lorraine. Okay, <clears throat> so we know that there are probably about 400 components on, on your average bike. And then when you add into that e-bikes and um, pedal electric bikes, then cargo bikes, then the, 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 the number of components kind of starts to expand dramatically. Um, this was a little, a little infographic we pulled together last year for some work that we did with Frog Bikes, a brand I'm sure many of you are familiar with on the call. Um, and what it did was it tried to kind of deconstruct the bike into some of the main componentries uh, components. And what you'll notice if you can, if your if your screen is large enough, um, is that most of the manufacturing processes, back back, all of the manufacturing processes that are on this screen, um, we we have capability to meet those kind of manufacturing processes in Scotland. So we're already doing um, these processes. And what you'll also notice is um, most of the component, a big chunk of the components are made from materials such as aluminium. And Scotland's already well placed from a supply chain perspective, even from the raw material, because we have the likes of Alvance up in Le Haber, who are one of Europe's only wholly green aluminium smelters. And my colleagues in Highlands and Islands Enterprise are also working with Alvance to do some major capital investment over the next kind of couple of years. A, to expand their manufacturing capability um, to meet demand, um, but also to look at new processes which will enable them to recycle aluminium. So if we're looking at the potential supply chain in Scotland, we have the raw materials, we have the manufacturing capability, and we have the innovation system uh, in terms of our academic expertise and the support of the economic development agencies. Uh, next slide, please, Lorraine. So what? Yeah, so what? The reason, um, as Charlotte kind of indicated, decarbonising transport is really important to Scotland. Improving productivity is really important to the Scottish economy. Continuing to drive Scotland forward as a nation of innovators is really important for the Scottish economy. So the thinking is that if we can continue to drive forward our support for the existing bike supply chain market, we are setting ourselves up to be a supply chain for future markets. And that future market is the electric pedal assist vehicle market. Um, and some of these vehicles are already in the market here. They're already on our streets. And some of those are, are on the screen right now. Um, and 
the, what Charlotte was indicating in the start of her presentation is that as policy starts to change, as we start to see more towns and cities and governments, et cetera, across Europe, looking at what their, um, their emission zones are going to be, um, and those of you in the Central Belt will know that Glasgow has already announced that they're going to an ultra low emission zone this June, and that's going to start to change the, the types and numbers of vehicles that we'll see in our towns and cities. And policy is going to continue to drive that change. So eventually there will be no cars, no trucks, no lorries, no nothing in our towns and cities. And that means that the way that we move people and things around our towns and cities is going to have to change. And this is where the pedal electric vehicle really kind of comes into its own. And if we have a supply chain for the existing cycling and e-bike market, we are potentially setting ourselves up to have a supply chain for this new version of a vehicle, which is going to come onto our streets in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And that's the purpose of this piece of work here is to start to evidence what that might look like for Scotland and, and what we might be able to kind of bring to the table. But all of these vehicles are going to require, well, they'll all have innovation challenges and we need to identify what those challenges are and what Scotland has already in its manufacturing and innovation ecosystem to support these new markets to be developed. Okay, next slide, please, Lorraine. And we are a nation of innovators. Um, some of you will recognise this guy in the middle. Um, this is the very first prototype of a bike. It was developed by a guy called Kirkpatrick McMillan in a little old town called Thornhill, which is not too far from, from where I'm sitting today. Um, so we already are innovating around the bike from way back when, when Kirkpatrick McMillan came up with his original kind of prototype. But all of the other images on this screen are also Scottish innovations from existing bike components to batteries to um, e-bike and pedal electric vehicle kind of motors, gears, batteries, etc. So we know how to innovate around the bike in Scotland and we have already got the kind of capability within the innovation ecosystem, as I was saying, to innovate around this new market, which potentially could have the same impact on the Scottish economy as the automotive industry does for, for, the, for the Midlands. Um, next slide, please, Lorraine. But as Charlotte said, and we can do all the desk research and we'll hear in a moment um, what's, what's happening around that. We can gather market intelligence from data that's already available out there to us to try and evidence that there is a potential um, economic opportunity for Scotland in this space. But we need to hear from industry. Um, so whether you are a business who's already in the bike supply chain market, whether you're a componentry supplier or whether you're a whole bike supplier or you're doing something else in the bike space, we need to hear from you what your views are of how this market's going to grow and what you think, you know, um, Scottish industry's opportunity is there. It's also if you're potentially a vehicle manufacturer for one of the new vehicles, the, the new pedal electric vehicles that are coming online, what do you see as your innovation challenges? Um, what do you see as the type of support that you're going to need to commercialise your idea and grow your place in that sector? But also if you're a user, if you're a potential a business or OEM or somebody who's going to need one of these kind of new vehicles when they come on stream, what do you need it to do so that we can start to look in how we can support these kind of ideas and commercialise them from a very, very early stage, almost kind of looking at design for manufacturer rather than coming forward with a blueprint for something that we then have to go and supply the, find the supply chain from. Let's look at this kind of organically. So we need your viewpoints and um, we need to hear what, what you as industry think so that we can evidence both from an ambition, an ability, a capability and, you know, a capacity to innovate around this kind of sector. So that as Scottish government um, starts to look at where declining markets are kind of happening, such as maybe oil and gas, whether some of that lost revenue, lost turnover, lost productivity could be replaced by, by this new opportunity. But we need evidence from industry. Um, to let us know what that is. So um, that's thank you, as I say, for, for your time this morning, everybody that's joined this call. This is really just the start of a very, very interesting discussion. And um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for the, the next two webinars, which I know Dan and the team will explain later on. But um, yep, I'm looking forward to seeing where this piece of work goes. So thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you. Fantastic. I think that's now back to me. Um, so what I'll do now is just take a little bit of time explaining some more detail behind the project. Um, Moira just uh, and, and Charlotte both hinted at, at some of the details about what we're undertaking. Um, 
if I can move on to, well, two slides ahead, actually, Lorraine, if that's okay. All righty, what's in a name? Look, I know you're all thinking, what is with the terminology these people are using? Um, everyone has their opinion, and believe me, we've spent hours going back and forth on how to describe what we're doing. <laughs> so um, I, I don't think there's any one right answer. We could go with European definitions. We could go with British definitions. Um, yeah, there's, there's many different terminologies being used. But being a research project, uh, we aren't, yeah, and, and looking at it from a supply chain perspective, we don't want to limit ourselves to a particular type of vehicle that may be constrained by whether it's regulatory descriptions or some sort of technical description. We're trying to be all encompassing to, to maximize the opportunity that supplies to this industry can cover. I saw someone in the chat talked about um, supplying fasteners. People aren't just going to supply fasteners to Pedelex. So, um, yeah, it is quite broad. We're using electric assisted vehicles and cycles to be quite broad. Obviously, being assisted, that implies that there is some sort of other mechanism of mot um, motion. So it doesn't apply to things like electric vehicles, um, because without their electricity, they ain't really going anywhere unless you're rolling down a hill. Um, so, yeah, I won't go into, into this any detail, but just to let you know, we have thought long and deep about it, but it is uh, broad for a good reason. Um, so, so hopefully that will satisfy the needs. Um, one thing that we've kind of gone back and forth on is the the reference to a pedal. I, I think we're we're working looking a little bit future into the future a little bit now. Crystal ball doesn't always work the best, but we're hoping that the the concept of a pedal falls by the wayside, um, and in regulatory worlds that that there might become a more clear definition. We're also sort of allowing for vehicles that haven't even been imagined yet that might fall within this sector. So, um, yeah, as I said, trying to be all encompassing. Next slide, right? So what are we looking at? Uh, as suggested, I mean, Charlotte's talked about the interest from Transport Scotland and the previous work uh, in heavy duty vehicles and the mechanisms in investing and boosting sectors like this. Uh, so, you know, this, this method has been done before and has been has proven successful. Um, but of course, it's all going to be based upon evidence at the end of the day. And of course, we want to build on the existing work that Moira has done. I should also point out that our, our research is actually Europe wide. While the investment is clearly going to be Scottish, uh, we do want to understand uh, everyone's perspective from across the UK and, and the rest of Europe. We have and already have, uh, have and will be reaching out to um, players, OEMs, different level suppliers in this sector. Um, from uh, our shores, it is really about the capabilities of the sector and what is existing on offer and what is what is the potential in businesses that may not currently exist or businesses that have capability, but just don't focus on this sector just yet. Um, and obviously, we, we want to match that with demand, understanding what the real demand is from OEMs and the marketplace across the whole of Europe. Um, and the output there is... Uh, it's always a report at the end, um, but it is also encompassed in our final presentation. Hopefully we can give you a, a, a substantial amount of these outcomes, but a contribution towards the evidence base, the business case for future Scottish government investment um, within the area. And understanding what you need. Uh, that's the, the other demand side of it is uh, understanding those needs. So next slide, Lorraine. <clears throat> The process we're going through uh, over the last month, we've been doing some a lot of desk research and starting to engage um, players and companies in the sector there. So gathering lots of evidence. Uh, one major component is that engagement, and that primarily is these events. Uh, this is the first webinar, as I as I mentioned. Thanks for being here. A couple of weeks' time, we'll have another one where we'll start sharing some of the details of and and more detail on, on what's been uncovered. You'll get a taste in a minute of that. Uh, and the, the last one will basically be sort of the final showcase where we will uh, really start getting some companies in, involved there from a demand side, ideally, and share with you our, our concluding results. Next slide. Our request of you, um, we need to justify this future investment. So we want to talk to you. Uh, your perspective on the supply and demand. We realize that you know the the explosion during the pandemic has waned somewhat. The dynamics of the market are changing. So hearing it from the horse's mouth is the ideal way to do that. Um, a lot of you probably have a lot of information already on you know the the documentation around this sector, but we we need more detail. 
and exploring on what you actually need. Of course, everyone's got their hand up for some money. Every every small small or large business can use some extra cash, but what else can be provided um, is is what we're interested in. Because sometimes you know there there are, we just can't hand out money. <laughs> so, what else can be provided to help accelerate and grow your opportunity in this sector? The ways of doing it: uh, sign up for future events these future events so we can reach out to you. Uh, we do have a, an active survey right now, which will be shared with you at the end of this webinar. Um, it you might turn up in the chat box sooner than that. And also, if you have something burning you want to tell us about, then please do contact us. Also, further in the presentation, we'll uh, provide email addresses to get in contact. So next slide. That provides kind of the overview of yeah our motivations behind this project, what we're doing. I mentioned we've been active. Well, actually, it's nearly six weeks now. We've been conducting the research. It uh, The work does wrap up uh, over Easter, and then we'll have our final event. So that's kind of the time frame that we're working within. And at the end of that, we'll have, a, have that final report and that final event. But right now, just to give you a, a taste of what else is happening in, in Scotland, in particular, in the supply chain, we thought we'd invite along a bit of a rock star startup. Well, it was a startup. I don't know. They've moved along quite a bit right now. But um, I'd like to invite David Hemming, who I believe is here, um, to come and do the presentation. David is the Managing Director of Free Flow Technologies, who I believe only started up a couple of years ago. So we'll hear a little bit more about that. David's going to talk about his company, the product, and hopefully provide some perspective on the future direction and the industry as a whole. Um, I believe the only change here, Dave, is I think you're going to have to let us know when to change slides. It turns out we may not be able to share it with you. I hope that's okay. Okay. Fantastic. Right, so Lorraine, maybe move on to the first and, slide. Um, yeah. Ah, oh, there we go. Look at that. Uh, it's a complete change. I have no beard today. So uh, keep you on your toes. It's almost like um, the born affair changing my 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 appearance. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. Rockstar is something uh, very interesting to use against us. We're definitely um, rocking the world of e-bike side of things. And just to pause on this and reflect for a moment that this is a bike that we've done through our cut and shut program lo using local companies in Scotland to create our demo fleet that we take out to the wider client base of the OEM bicycle industry globally for them to test ride our transmission that we've designed and developed in Scotland. Um, so next, next slide, please, Lorraine. So our goals and achievements as a company, we were actually um, a little bit more than two years in the making. We are actually had been established for just over 13 years, a company founded by uh, Neil McMartin, uh, an entrepreneurial guy that came up with the concept idea of an e-bike transmission, along with other ideas within the e-mobility sector. We've really buttoned down and doubled down on our uh, strategy going forward and become an OEM supplier to the global bicycle industry with aims of providing volume product to those manufacturers globally. Um, we've now developed our first system that you can see here, which is our first market viable product that has now been shipping uh, since August last year to brands. And FreeFlow as a company will always be that, uh, as Dan described us as a rock star company, creating intellectual property that gives us a point of difference uh, for a reason to engage uh, with us as a, as a supplier uh, for the uh, end client. So we've completed our design on a mid-drive bike uh, e-bike solution. We have patented technology around the world to protect this product in the market's place. Um, we've created a product that is really easy for a bike brand to design a frame around, which is a key USP. We can deliver our product faster to those um, bike clients, uh, bike brand clients, and the nature of our supply chain side of things. Um, it's faster for those brands to install that product so they can get their bike to market quicker, launch it into the market quicker, back up uh, orders quicker for the nature of how quickly they can get these bikes off the product line. One of the key things that we always set out to do was to create an e-bike that looks like a, a normal bike. And from the side on from the previous slide that you saw that the bike really does look like a normal bike because the transmission disappears behind the chain ring in the middle of the bike. And the nature of the design that internally we've created is that the bike, once it goes past its regulatory cutoff speed, which is governed by EU law, that the bike rides like a normal bike. So the only resistance the rider experiences is the equivalent of what they get on an analog bike of the bottom bracket bearings and the pedal bearings. And we talk about being a green clean tech industry. We looked at currently the competitors and the way they're handling their service or not handling their service, that we have to have something that has a shelf life so the end consumer can buy into this with confidence that down the road, this can be serviced at any bike shop in the world with replacement parts. Uh, next slide, please, Laura. So 
So over the last 12 months, we've created a market value product that we've shipped to clients into the market through what we call our Generation 1 product. We've sold roughly around 30 systems to 30 different bike brands that are now developing their frames to launch their bikes into the market later on this year and beyond. And in the last year, we've been recognized for over a decade's worth of work by winning a startup award in Scotland and also being recognized by um, the Scottish MTB fraternity for an innovation award. So it's a great testament to the team that we have here at East Kilbride. We've seen brands launch into the market space, so in the public domain events like the Goodwood Revival that sees close to 200,000 people coming through its doors over a weekend. And their product has certainly resonated with those uh, types of customers. And that brand is actually repeat ordering with us already, which is really positive. But the key thing is not to just be an OEM that sits within the bike client's uh, product uh, and out within the independent bike store. We want to make sure that the bike shops out there know that our system is fully serviceable. So partnering with SciTech, a national training body that trains mechanics for certification on bicycle service and mechanics, is that they will launch a module within their e-bike uh, service training course and will be the only transmission in that course that will be uh, taking apart um, for those mechanics to learn on how to service to then further create a revenue new stream in their shops they don't currently have with the e-bike sales they're currently making so long-term service um, revenue from um, labor charges and part replacement side of things we've constantly working our pipeline the pandemic has certainly accelerated the mobilization of communities we know that bike brands are falling over themselves to to activate uh, e-mobility programs that they want to get into the into the market and so we're seeing brands globally coming to us uh, with the, uh, the recognition of the product that we've created, the ease of use of implementation into their frame designs. And so we've got a lot of brands uh, that have already tested, around 29 brands tested just this year alone. And furthermore, another 12 brands developing frames that will be launching later on this year. We've created faster order lead times. We've got roughly um, three months to complete any order that anybody places with us. And, you know, that's against our competitors at ranging anywhere from up to one to two years for product delivery. The nature of the pandemic and the amount of bikes being sold as well has seen that our competitors have kind of raised the bar for engagement. You know, MOQs, minimum order quantities, have, have gone out of reach for virtually every handmade bike brand in the world. They've gone out of the reach for a lot of SME national level brands. They just can't commit to the unit numbers that that the competitors are, are asking for now. And then the lead times just cripples them because they can't wait one to two years to activate a mobility program. Whereas we're saying we're the flexible company. Um, you know, there's no minimum order quantity. All you have to do is buy two to develop your bikes and you tell us what your business model needs. So we're not putting the financial constraints on those clients to get themselves into that, that e-sector. But saying that, you know, the ripples are going far and wide and the bike consortiums around the world, the likes of the Pond Bike Group and the XL Group that are... Um, consuming bike brands left, right, and center, creating these large conglomerate portfolios of bike brands are reviewing our products. So we know there's a bigger play, you know, one to two years down the road with the blue chip companies um, in, in the marketplace. Um, next slide, please, Laura. So all of this presents great market opportunities. What's happened over the last couple of years is the, the pandemic, and I don't mean to be insensitive about this, but it has accelerated the thought process at community level, uh, at a local government level, and certainly at a national government level to, um, to mobilize communities in the fact of putting um, emergency infrastructure in, and in many ways, turning that emergency infrastructure into permanent fixtures for the widening of bike lanes uh, and for the use of getting people out of public transport. So we see that over the next, uh, between 2022 and 23, there'll be 130 million private e-bike sales to end consumers, which is a real positive. And prior to the pandemic, we saw you know revenue forecast by 2030 sort of touching just shy of 30 billion, but that's actually moved up a little bit quicker to 2028 and in the sort of 45 billion annually. So we know that the growth uh, opportunity is there. And then we have to look at this at a granular level. Country by country, we're seeing, as an example, in Germany, 43% of all bike sales in Germany now are e-bikes. So that overlap is almost 50-50. In some territories, it is surpassed that for countries like Holland and Belgium, where the demographics obviously ride a lot more. The e-bike is certainly taken over. But what does that really present to, to us as a, as a company? Well, the opportunities for free flow is that a year ago, we had 70 brands that we were in baseline negotiations with. We now have 80 brands that we have deep negotiations with, testing with, doing cut and shuts with, helping them accelerate their development process to get into the market. And again, we're using Scottish-based businesses to assist nationwide companies to accelerate their development processes. We've got great revenue opportunities with global brands like Cannondale and Specialized, for example. You know, we're negotiating with those brands to, to expand, you know, potential sales that could generate, you know, incoming revenues for free flow in, in Scotland for around 30 million plus. Uh, next slide, please. 
So really what's happening with the market is, is, is a little bit on its laurels in some ways. The competitors aren't really innovating to a great extent. We are seeing some slightly smaller systems coming out. We are seeing some slight uh, weight losses in some of those systems, but it's not leaps and bound changes. So in many ways, we're still seeing a lot of e-bikes that still primarily look quite agricultural. Um, the bikes are quite bulky and heavy, as you can see from here on the left. Uh, and the lead times for the bicycle industry is a stranglehold right now. So the development side of things for brands is, is a challenge to get into the market. We know the supply chain base is really kind of putting people on the back foot to being able to deliver bikes into the marketplace. Um, and the servicing is still a big issue. So with the supply chain stranglehold, when transmissions are going wrong and a client needs a replacement, they can't get that replacement. So you've got customers making an informed purchase, a high-end premium purchase, now can't ride those bikes for months on end because there's no availability. Uh, to, 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 to get that consumer running again. And our solution really is just really resonating with the, with the bicycle industry globally. You know, like we said, a faster development time for a frame to be put together for a brand, we can insist in that with our cut and shut program. Our stock delivery lead time is faster than our competitors. Our, the assembly time is quicker once those systems are delivered and it's a faster route for the market uh, to, to get into the market for the brand with their product. And as you can see from this picture, we've created a bike that, that looks like a normal bike and rides like a normal bike. And we continue to strive on that green, clean tech side of things of being fully serviceable. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just some quick testimonials. I won't read them verbatim, but you know, these are some key brands that are, are, are sort of looking at our product and coming back to us with some ideas. I can certainly circulate this after this presentation. Um, if I can go on to the next slide, please. So how do we deal with our commercial pipeline? We're looking at it in a very different way. We're splitting it, kind of um, reversing it. You know, everyone would focus on the big ticket kind of side of things. We think there's a better opportunity to build a better brand profile in the marketplace. We create three tiers and those three tiers are tier one of the handmade bike brands, the most artisan bike builders in the market. And this is replicated country by country around the world. There are these styles of brands in every country. They have the fastest lead time to market. They have the media looking at their brands because they create such beautiful artisan made bikes. They're influential because these are the bikes that people want to turn up at the coffee shop on or at the trail mountain bike head. And this is a great opportunity for us to build a really pro good profile of customers uh, that basically are creating brand ambassadors talking about the free flow uh, side of things. The tier two SME national level brands, slightly longer lead times to market. But again, we're looking at brands there that how we can actually move them forward on that side of things. So typically a brand can give us an analog bike from their range. We in a month can turn that around with what we call our cut and shut program, where we take that bottom bracket out, put in our motor bracket for them, give them a bottle battery extender. And basically they've got a working e-bike that they can test the transmission and test the ideas of that particular concept of bike. And obviously we want to be working with the tier three long terms because that's the real sort of volume uh, and revenue goals for, for free flow technologies as a company. The blue chip brands, they have revenues in the billions. They're looking to move and shake this industry the whole time. And they're challenging the status quo of technology and innovation. And like we've got great engagement with brands that could be bringing in, you know, they're, they're telling us, you know, typical starting order patterns for them are anywhere from 25,000 units to 100,000 units, which, you know, totally puts a, a strain on, on supply. But they're saying that these are challenges for them right now that they need to be working through. Uh, next slide, please. To give you an idea of kind of where we're working on this in, in, in product development, in tier ones right now, we've got a number of brands that we've shipped those systems to, and we're talking to a lot of the national SME level brands and, uh, you know, working through some cut and shut side of things. You know, Frisco e-bikes is based out of Aberdeen that is working with us. And there's some British brands there that we're, you know, that names that people will recognize. And if we look at just the baseline side of things, you know, if we, we, we get these clients over the line, the revenue numbers are pretty strong as a company from 687 in the tier, thousand, uh, tier one brands over the next three years. The SME tier two level brands generate 9.5 million in revenues for us. And the potential worth of the tier threes and the brands we're talking to right now could generate over 21 million annually for us. So there's a great opportunity for us to be closing some, some great business that will all come through Scotland. Next slide, please. 
all of this obviously is supported by marketing and media plan. You know, we're, we're not a typical end consumer kind of marketing strategy. We are an OEM. We are embedded within the industry. But obviously, we want to do advertising and advertorial with the cycle industry channels, trade publications, and the end consumer publications to support those brands when they're launching their products in the marketplace. We'll do the traditional formats of print and digital. And we'll work with brands like GCN, EMBN and alike to basically tell our story and narrative about our company being in Scotland and what it is we're creating here on home soil. As a company, we will expand into trade shows to expand our OEM um, uh, sales. And we'll look at typical shows like you know, Taipei, um, Eurobike and Taichung Bike Week. But the key thing with all of those shows and some of those at a national level is connect with the bike shops to inform them about the part sales and revenue opportunities in the service side of things that we're offering. And we're supporting all of that by expanding our team here in Scotland with bringing in a marketing team in-house rather than farming it out to an agency to keep our content and stories enriched and what it is we're doing. Next slide, please. We've also got a product roadmap and, you know, certainly working with Moira and the team at SE, you know, the, the word that everyone talks about is reshoring. It's, you know, I'm pretty adamant on this. It's not reshoring, it's local sourcing, knowing what we have on our own doorstep to be able to accelerate development of our products going forward uh, and being able to actually potentially look at having that product made on home soil as well. So we can break down the, uh, the barriers of communication. We can break down the lead times that have got a stranglehold on the industry at this time. And you know, we'll look to be developing these products of, of uh, value add value engineering in our current Gen 1 product in Gen 1.5. We've already got um, product roadmap ideas around Gen 2 and Gen 3. And we're also looking at the easy, um, what we call low hanging fruit of the cargo solution, because the finesse of a cargo solution transmission doesn't have to be um, as compact and tiny as a standard um, looking bike, whereas the cargo EAV style platform of product can actually be embedded within the chassis so we can offer power alternatives very quickly, we feel uh, our engineering team is, is um, looking at at this stage. Um, next slide, please. So all of this is underpinned by you know a fantastic team here at um, Freeflow Technologies. There are you know there are some people that are you know we would say consultants within the business. Our chairman of the board, uh, Scott from Glasgow, Martin McCourt, a name that many of you might know, the former global CEO of Dyson of 15 years, is our chair, uh, and a very great insight into the growth of business and capital light modelling. Um, the likes of Neil Edwards, who also came from Dyson, is a former um, global director of operations of Dyson, moved the production from the UK to Malaysia uh, side of things. So he understands how to stand up facilities. And we're certainly looking at supply chain base here in the UK to accelerate that. And then Nick Sow, who's a former Tata Technologies director, uh, who is an interim technical director for us here. And all three of those as consultants are investors financially within this company. So they see what we're creating as a great opportunity of, of mobilizing communities. Within that, we've got um, you know a, a plethora of experience across the the from coming from the automotive sector, medical, and uh, the cycle industry side of things, which really adds to a great um, engineering team. And going forward, our business plan has a uh, strategy to employ uh, thirty nine new heads within the business. Thirty five of those will be based here in Scotland as we double our engineering team to deliver that product roadmap that I've mentioned. Next slide, please. And all of this builds into a scale to just give you a snapshot of how we're going to be scaling our production and revenues. Um, we're in a funding round at this particular time with our current cap table of investors, um, Scottish Enterprise being one of those. Um, we are focused heavily on our tier one brands right now, the handmade bike brands that will give us our early revenues through 23. Going into 24, we'll be expanding our facilities at East Kilbride. Um, and as our tier two brands go live in that phase as well, we are also building up our outsourced and production program. We are looking to... Um, uh, look at uh, not making all of this here ourselves directly. We are looking at doing sub-assembly side of things with uh, various partners, and we're looking heavily at uh, localizing that where we can. And all this is to scale towards the high volume product side of things with the with the tier tier three side of things. So pretty aggressive um, program going forward over the next three years. Um, but all of this is playing out based on the negotiations we're currently having with those global bike brands. Uh, next slide, please. That's it for me. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Dave. Um, I did have a quick question. We're supposed to save questions for the end, but you mentioned it's it's quite a mature startup. What's been happening for the last 12 years? Like, I, I think there's probably people in the audience interested in sort of where the company originated or the, or the founders and sort of how they got into spotting this as an opportunity. Yeah, so Neil McMartin is the son of Craig McMartin, the family bike shop that was based in Scotland. And Neil um, is an, an, an IBM entrepreneur 
uh, advisor to city kind of mobilization. And he had an idea for the first initial, what we called ETS1 transmission. And he went through the typical kind of uh, startup growth side of things, you know, local investment with family and friends, and uh, eventually started to, you know, he's very good at connecting with people and, and started courting literally Martin McCourt. And uh, the business plan initially was, e-bike motors make its own bikes open its own bike shops nationally and all that side of things which just was capital intensive whereas martin advised the business to become an oem because there was a bigger volume play and the technology itself was not just about you know well there's a great opportunity with e-mobility let's go do a product a me too product the same as everybody else it's always been about creating a point of difference not for the sake of just designing something for the sake of designing something but it's also we're hearing a lot more bike brands say they don't just want to be a hanger for the current competitors product out there they want to have a differentiator that gives them something from everybody else on the sales floor and so the business itself in 2018 when um, foresight group came in as an investment with the eis williams advanced engineering funding platform wae williams formula one racing looked at the technology and said that free flow technologies was absolutely onto something in the ip space and invested in that company but there was some provisos with that investment coming in that martin stepped up to being chair Neil Edwards came in as COO and that the business then steered itself into bringing in an F, um, an MD that was cycling industry focused or about to become that. And so that's where the point I came in in um, mid 2019. And from then, you know, the, it really has been that refinement and, and delicacies of getting the technology to its final um, through its final stage gate processes and signed off as a production ready intent system. And, um, you know, I have to say we'd be a lot further where, uh, down the road now because of the pandemic. We we literally had that that shutdown. We were uh, into a funding round in 2020 that was supposed to close at the end of March, and we had to re-circulate uh, that, come together as a board um, because the funding round didn't go the direction we wanted. We changed things on that, went for three tranches of investment, which worked, and we brought in um, the likes of Calvin Capital in the year, which is when Scottish Enterprise came into uh, supporting uh, this, this Scottish founded business. And so from there, we relocate the company back from the, the Warwickshire side of things when it moved down there to be near WAE and uh, brought it back to its roots of East Kilbride. And, you know, in the pandemic, you know, there were challenges around that. We, you know, I had to furlough a lot of the team because our facilities were closed at uh, the MTC in Coventry out of our control. Um, that was the government rules. And so those the team couldn't do their jobs because they couldn't take the machinery home with them. So the reality was we had go slow whilst we had the pandemic hit us. Yet... We managed to keep the wheels, the proverbial wheels turning on the project, keeping, you know, um, final technology stuff being sorted out based with a, a very narrow team here in Scotland. And once the doors literally opened a little bit more, we were able to then go out and employ the replacements because the nature of the furlough side of things, we relocated the company. We ended up losing um, six of our engineers because they didn't want to take the relocation packages uh, to Scotland. So we had to find heads up here to, to replace those. And no disrespect to the team that we lost. I think the team we now have is um, is a very driven team. They're all cyclists, which really helps accelerate literally what we're achieving here because they understand the nature of the end consumer's choice of e-bikes. So that's a snapshot of the journey. Happy to take up one-to-one -one conversations or further questions on, on that. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Dave. I really appreciate it. Um, we are nice and well behind time, which is uh, I often think is a good thing. Um, but now we'll move on to... Our next section, which is sharing a few insights with the audience um, that we've come up that our research team has come across um, over the over the last six weeks or so. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to introduce my colleagues Anne Sophie Roy and Piot Mazur, who are senior consultants at Urban Foresight, um, who've been spearheading this research. And they just, as I mentioned, share a few insights with you over the next few minutes. Hopefully, uh, we're heading to the top of the hour, but Hopefully people can hang around. Uh, we'll If there's any questions as well, we've had a couple come in, but if there's any more questions, happy to answer those at the end. Um, over to you, I believe Anne Sophie is going to go first. Yes, that's right. Thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'll try not to deep to to dive too deep into details. Um, but Lorraine, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so yeah, we're going to introduce you to some of the first uh, findings that we've that we have from uh, our initial initial research. Um, so I think it's kind of an obvious st statement, but the EABC industry has been growing every year and significantly. Uh, but we have also noticed that the classification of, of EVAC um, um, varies between countries. 
uh, mainly on power, speed, license and regulation, age and weight limits. Uh, and also to give you an idea, uh, so the global e-bike market size was valued about more than $35 billion in 2021 and is expected to reach a CAGR of 12.6% between uh, 2022 and 2030. So as I said, it's a growing industry. Um, but it's not only about bikes anymore. So one of our obs observation is that uh, the industry has shifted in recent years and it's new hardware and new software technologies that have been adopted. Uh, and we've also observed that uh, many governments now offer support for consumers and small businesses to purchase CB EABCs. Uh, next slide, please. So now let's have a look at the EABC um, in global and national context. Um, so it can range from high-end custom-built bicycles to add-on components for conventional um, bicycles. And we have noticed that the major key players are in Europe with the Netherlands and Germany, but also North America with the US and Canada and Asia with Taiwan, Japan, and China. Uh, China being the top global supplier of EABC, uh, followed by the EU. We've noticed that the US has seen an increase in sale of uh, EABC, but the demand is still a fraction compared to China and the EU. Um, as for the UK, so in 2019, consumers bought about 2.5 million bikes with about only 6% of them being EABCs. Um, and that we have also 37 more percent more sales in the ABC than 2018. So it's showing that it's growing, but still compared to Germany, for example, uh, who have sold uh, 1.95 million e-bikes in 2020. It, the UK has the, I mean, it's a very different market. Um, so what we can conclude of that is that um, we have found that the value proposition of EABCs range from country to country, uh, and that it will be it would be important for Scotland to understand and work into their, their business models, basically what will set the Scottish market apart what will be the value proposition for the Scottish market will be like high-end Scotland made EABCs with sustainable business models or would it be uh, Scottish suppliers that work collaboratively across the globe with other manufacturers? We don't have an answer now. It's just something to think about. I would also be happy for you to share any opinion you might have on that question uh, in the chat and uh, that could really help us uh, feed into the research. Next slide, please. So now let's have a look at the wider landscape uh, that is supporting the EAVC industry. So we have four topics here, the policies, benefits, uncertainties, and interdependencies. So as for the policies, we have divided that into four main type of policies, which are uh, legal and regulatory. This is basically um, requirements that determine the classification of EABCs, uh, which comes down to power, speed, license and regulation, age and weight limits. We have manufacturing um, policies, which include those relevant to raw material, um, waste and recycling, the circular economy, uh, the approval processes to be considered uh, for manufacturers post-Brexit and so on. Then we have policies regarding model shift and incentives, um, who are, which are messaging from governments to support model shift away from private vehicles uh, towards a more low carbon mobility, as well as incentives for purchasing EABCs, like ride sharing schemes, the cycle to work scheme, uh, the tax, some tax breaks, and so on. The last one for the policies are national active travel and cycling strategies and plans. Uh, who demonstrate varying levels of commitments from country to country uh, on their investment in active travel, which may have a knock-on effect on EABC supply and demand. Um, so some of the benefits related to EABCs are obviously the health, the environmental considerations and the convenience. Uh, some uncertainties remained uh, with uh, the usability and the safety, the cycling infrastructure, and also the perceived acceptance. And finally, some interdependencies uh, in relationship like between EABCs and sustainability, net zero, raw material use, and etc. Next slide, please. Um, so when we're conducting any type of market or sector research, we usually 
organize our data into a force field analysis, uh, which demonstrate overarching driving and restraining forces that may be supporting or holding back a market, in this sense, the, e the EAVC industry. Uh, so we have divided that into three contexts, uh, markets, manufacturing and policy, with barriers and opportunities for each of them. So I'm not going to read all of that because this is a lot, but for example, some of the barriers for manufacturing that we have identified are the lack of collaboration between individual partners within the value chain, um, outsourcing, and also the lack of sustainable business models. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so now let's have a look into the funding landscape. So this is a very broad topic. It's funding is av available at any levels uh, from Europe, the UK, and also Scotland. It's available for businesses, businesses, small and large startups, uh, but also academic institution, research, third sector, etc. And the aim of this project is to find out how funding could be better targeted to advance the sector in Scotland. And on the right side of the slide uh, is just a list of some of the main funding players in Europe, UK and Scotland. So in Europe, you have uh, the European Regional Development Fund or initiatives such as the Horizon 2020 and Horizon Europe, Europe Civitas, InvestEU. Again, I'm not going to read uh, everything, but it's just to give you an overview of who are the main funding players. Next slide, please. And among all of those uh, funding opportunities that have existed in the past and that exist today, um, we have been able to divide them into two categories. So the main one would be the direct, which means like the, which funding opportunities have a direct impact into uh, the EABC industry, um, such as funding targeting, targeted for uh, advancing manufacturing capabilities, but also the digitization of manu manufacturing processes and uh, funding to develop the supply chain technology, innovation and sustainability in the UK and Scotland. But we also have to consider indirect funding, which in in eventually will support um, the, the demand and supply of the ABC industry, um, such as support for policy implementation to encourage active travel, but also investments in building in, uh, in new transport infrastructure, because if you don't have uh, bike lanes, if, you, if it's not safe for you to use your bike in your city, then maybe you will not consider buying one. And the last one would be purchases premiums, a tax reduction and other incentives uh, for consumers and small businesses or just businesses in general to uh, purchase e-bikes. So all of those are um, different funding opportunities that exist currently in the sector. And I think I reached the end of my part and I will let Piotr um, talk to you about the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Sophie. Next slide, please, Lorraine. Thank you very much. So, yeah, what struck me is what Moira said, that we're already very good at innovating because we are in Scotland. So this is about how the innovation sort of fits in with the wider sector. That's across all disciplines and all sectors that make up uh, EAVCs or EPAVs, PEDs, ELEC, whatever we want to call it. So the next few slides I'll try and rush through just because I know we are sort of behind time now. So the main purpose of it is to explain how our research into OEMs, what, what it's discovered, uh, so we're taking a broad look across the OEMs in Europe who are involved in making and selling EAVCs. We're focused on Scotland primarily than the UK, but as Dan said, we're looking at a wider European picture. Uh, this is just to explain the sort of over-focus on England. We know that England is not the biggest market in Europe, but uh, that's what we focus our research on. So yeah, it's a bit over-represented there. Uh, now, this is... Uh, relating to the number of OEMs rather than the volume that they produce. So it's biased towards countries with a history of lots of small bike manufacturers. So Germany, Italy are great examples here. England as well, to an extent. Uh, now we know that Portugal has become the biggest bike manufacturers in Europe now. You see that it's sort of represented there, but not to a big extent, just because the market there is focused on large scale production by a few a uh, few bigger manufacturers. So yeah, they sort of produce bikes in a different way than, than we do here. Uh, now the UK breakdown as well shows bike OEMs who are, who are not making GAVCs. In Scotland, that's five out of the nine we have identified. Across the UK, however, 
uh, most bike OEMs are involved in EAVCs, which was uh, an interesting finding that, that we've come across as well. So it's what, 65%, uh, which shows the interest in the sector, but also the potential uh, to tap the remaining uh, OEMs in the UK to making e-bikes as the demand continues to rise. Can I have the next slide, please, Lorraine? Now, this is about the manufacturing chain for EAVCs. So this shows how we classify the manufacturing chain and try to identify where sort of reshoring or local manufacturing could make the greatest impact. So you'll see a few categories there. And you'll see how the dark green uh, sector, so fabrication, component manufacture, assembly, and end of life care, how how those are the ones that we focus our research because that's the we believe that we have the highest potential for reshoring the, these sectors to Scotland. Uh, however, this is just just to show that we're looking at the whole supply sector, not just the dark green ones. Uh, component manufacturing, interesting, it was the most significant capability identified for Scottish companies. Uh, this includes those who already make parts for e-bikes, as well as companies we determined that are making relevant products such as spring and gears, but perhaps they're not in they're not involved in the sector as of now. Uh, and yeah, the broader project is aimed at sort of understanding why they might not be involved so far. Okay, the next slide, please, Lorraine. So the main purpose of the manufacturing chain capabilities in Scotland study was uh, to gather more details on the strength of the Scottish manufacturing chain. We've talked about how the wider chain needs to be looked at, not just what exists right now. So we've identified almost 200 companies so far, uh, but we are in the middle of the <clears throat> of the exercise. So we expect to add more through engagement and surveys and uh, and this webinar is part of this as well. Um, now, 25% of those are already involved with AEVCs, which is a number that we thought was higher than we believed initially. But again, that shows sort of the potential to increase that uh, and potential to show where companies might not be involved, uh, where the potential is there for them to manufacture relevant components. Uh, of the other ones, the strength are in precision manufacturing and production of plastics, molded components, uh, which could be useful for the manufacture of, manufacture of EAVC parts. It again shows what we, we thought is that Scotland is very good at high tech specialized components and that's what Scotland excels at the moment. So yeah, that sort of proves that to a point. Uh, and what Charlotte said as well, it's about engagement and listening. So what we need to do is make sure that we plug in the gaps in this research. We understand where the potential is. Um, and these, this, these findings were strengthened by further engagement and by the survey, which we introduce in a second. Uh, so that's the very initial findings that we had. Again, this is work in progress. So we will have more insights. So please tune to the next webinar. So, uh, and I think that's the end of this component. I'm not sure, Dan, there you go. I think we go to the Q&A next. I don't know if yep. we should introduce the survey here or whether... No, it's fine. It's um, fine. Okay, cool. So yeah, Thank we'll you. just move on. I don't know if we haven't had any questions in the chat. Um, so yeah, let me know if there's any questions. We'll just give it a minute. I don't know if anyone wants to I don't, uh, throw a question in the, the Q&A. There was one comment in there, but it was um, very specific. Oh, now we've got a question in there from Ken Hoskins. Um, so did you find any changes? I think this is a Piot uh, and Sophie, any change in tax mechanism for leasing or renting e-bikes? Yeah, Ken, I, I guess we're not sure what time frame you're talking about or when the change happened. Um, so unless any of our speakers have something specific there. Um, yeah, we're not, not really sure how to answer that question. Maybe we'll circle back with some detail there. Uh, David, sorry, you're asking if you could leave, but we've just got a question come in for you. So I can I see, know if I can see that. Yeah. Um, I, let me answer that for you, Katie. Is, um, yeah, the serviceability focus is a key part of our transmission to the nature of you've got to keep consumers riding their bikes. We can't talk about, for example, with what Ken Hoskins is doing at eFrisco, 
um, of having downtime of units. So you've got to be able to service them. Does that then translate up into, and is it maintainable with the tier threes? I think it's actually critical to the tier three brand, global blue chip brands. So the nature of it is when they implement our product and sell it out into the wider IBD market, we want to know where they're selling it so we can direct connect with those. And then we'll put in the service team uh, operatives, you know, country by country to speak those languages uh, to deal with that. But certainly from a UK perspective, we want to know where the product's being sold through so we can have that outreach and build that um, relationship with the bike shop so that they can be trained either through SciTech or through our tech service videos, but they'll have direct access to our parts service purchasing. So I hope that uh, answers that question for you. Great. Um, as always, so as, as it sees on the screen there, I mean, this is only the first in a series. So if you've got any more questions that come up after, after this or haven't been completely answered today, definitely reach out to us. Um, if we can just jump to the next screen, we the, the mechanisms of engagement are, yep, uh, please fill out the survey, which hopefully we're going to be able to paste that in the chat as well. Sorry, next screen, if we can move forward. Oh, sorry, we're seeing... Oh, sorry, David, there's another question for you in the, the Q&A there. Um, yeah, um, as I'm please... Um... Uh, grab my email address from the team here and we can have a conversation um, offline about that. Yeah, please do. Yeah, I'm sure uh, filling out your supply chain is an ongoing effort and probably always will be <laughs> always. Yeah. Um, as far as your options there. Um, sorry, Lorraine, can we go back to the screen with the uh, QR code on it? Thanks. Um, so sorry, we, we really do have to wrap up. We're 15 minutes over time, but thank you very much. We'll try and follow up with any uh, lingering questions as we can. Um, Moving forward, so the three ways to engage us are definitely uh, sign up for our next event. Um, please fill out the survey and contribute to, to the discussion as it were. Uh, hopefully that link will get put in the chat as well. Um, and the other way is, of course, yeah, as I said, sign up for the next event, next two events um, in the series. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon. If you really want to do contact us directly, the email address is mobility at urbanforesight.org. Uh, please send any message to that and we'll respond to those as quick as possible. And again, if we missed answering any of your questions, feel free to follow up using that email address as well. Uh, quickly, mobility at urbanforesight.org. Otherwise, Thanks to our presenters. Uh, thank you all for coming along today. And thanks to the Scottish Enterprise and Transport Scotland for making this all happen. I uh, look forward to seeing you at the next event. I think you will have a lot more results from the research and a lot more companies to engage with um, and, and have deeper discussions uh, at, at our second event. And as I said, the third one is more about wrapping up and uh, sharing the, the final results and conclusions that we've got from this work. Um, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. We'll talk again soon. Look forward to seeing you at the next event.